Ed here with the Digital Digest, and today I wanted to share my first look at the Sony A7R Mark V. Now, this camera launched at the end of 2022 with a retail price of roughly $3,900 US dollars body alone. I'll include a link in the description. And this is the most expensive A7R ever made, but of course, as you might expect, it also is the most feature-rich and arguably the best A7R ever made. So, do you need this camera? Well, I can't tell you that. This is the day it arrived. What I can tell you is, at least on paper, what improved. So, I've owned every A7R ever made except for this one. Reason being, I was gifted an A1, so I sold my A7R Mark IV. Don't want to get into that too much. I'll save that for another video. But one of the biggest improvements, at least here in the fifth generation, is the new display. Not only is it fully articulating, as you might expe uh, expect with a flippy screen, but then we also have the ability now to bring it off the body, which means if you need to show, basically see the display at any vantage point, you're going to be able to. So overhead shots, uh, low shots, it doesn't matter. And of course, you know, however you want to frame. So this is a display that I think we're going to see on a lot of Sony cameras going forward. It's unfortunate it doesn't exist on some of the newer cameras like the FX30. This is definitely for any video shooters ideal, but it's ideal for any camera. And I would say already just in the little bit of time that I've spent with this, this display appears to be a game changer. And I mean, I knew that before it arrived here in the studio. The other thing you'll want to know is that we now have an AI processing unit, which is the beginning of what should be uh, a revolution in photography. Now, we've already had AI play its roles, uh, or role rather, in point and shoot uh, devices like our smartphones, and of course, cameras like the ones I use from. Uh, Insta360, but here Sony has begun what now they've continued with uh, the ZV-E1, which hopefully I'll be getting to review sooner or late, sooner rather than later. And basically, instead of just real-time tracking with the autofocus system, and by the way, this is still capped at 10 frames per second, for those of you wondering about continuous shooting, you now have, again, rather than real-time tracking, you have real-time recognition as Sony is coining it. And that's because if it loses a lock on your subject, for example, with eye autofocus, it'll then use the AI processing unit to just focus on the body of that subject. So this way, giving it more to tack onto uh, before it will, in theory, again, lose focus. So the AI processing unit in here simply isn't in the A1 or any other camera before it, and that does make it unique. And arguably for some people, it makes it better from an autofocus standpoint, even though it you know, caps out at 10 frames as opposed to the 30 on my A1. Again, with the help of that AI processing unit, you may, in many ways, uh, get more keepers because you have you know, a more intelligent uh, acquisition unit, if you will. So real-time tracking coined with the launch of the A6400, now referred to as real-time recognition for obvious reasons. Um, beyond that, we have better Wi-Fi. We have an improved EVF, which is supposed to be the best in the business. Of course, I will report back, but I anticipate that it will be excellent. Um, I'll be sad it's not in my A1, but hey, uh, the A1 will have a successor, I presume. Uh, but don't want to get sidetracked on that. Uh, other things to note about the improvements. I mean, we're working with that same 60 megapixel sensor from the A7R4, which is not a bad thing. In fact, it still outperforms the sensor on my A1, at least in terms of resolution. Uh, dynamic range here, excellent. We still have five axis image stabilization, but the buffer is no longer hindered. So if you have one of these little babies, that is a, if I can get it in focus, a compact flash express type A card, you will be able to shoot essentially to your heart's content now, even with that 60 megapixel sensor, something the previous generation obviously we could not do. So anyone worried about this camera getting slow, shooting 10 frames per second raw, that is yet another change uh, that has been made. That doesn't mean that the sensor has the fastest readout, but the buffer uh, issues from the previous generations, those have supposedly been uh, solidified. The faster Wi-Fi wi performance is welcome, no question about it. Here are the two memory card uh, slots. Again, Compact Flash, Express Type A, as well as SD cards. Um, and you know you can run those in whatever orientation you prefer. On the other side of the body, we have all of our I.O. 
So whether you're looking for raw HDMI out, flash sync, I mean, you've got everything here, um, microphone in, uh, type C connectivity, monitoring capability. These are not new elements of you know, the A7R line, but something I still want to show for anyone that is curious. And of course, we still have the good old micro USB that Sony is going to carry to the very end, which I don't have a problem with as long as it serves a function and it still does. Um, you can use Sony's uh, edge imaging software with this. Um, they've made some improvements uh, to the way you can use the pixel shift capture, which I think is another interesting element. Uh, one area that I've heard, you know, uh, majority of criticism comes with the 8K recording. So we have 8K video capability on here, but the rolling shutter uh, on here is terrible. Uh, I've seen and heard that it is inferior to the A1. So that's disheartening. Remember the A1 has that stacked sensor, again, trying to stay away from comparing. Uh, but uh, the overall improvements here between the AI processing unit, the EV, uh, of course, the display being fully articulating, and then we've even got an improvement on the control dial, because as you may have noticed, we actually have a dedicated control to switch into video mode now, which I really like. Um, I've always looked at the A7R as a hybrid camera. Granted, it hasn't always favored video, but really since I think the, the second generation and then even better in the third gen, the video performance was vastly superior. So while this still is a still camera first, I think now having that quick switch to go from still to video and then the S and Q mode is just a really nice quick jog dial. Um, no question about that major improvement. I'll throw a lens on here. Um, and uh, the menu system also has been revamped. I would say this is pretty much what many people wished the A7R uh, for should have been or could have been, and now it's realized here in the A7R5, and I don't think that's a bad thing. If I go ahead and just power this on, um, you will quickly see uh, that we are working with that new menu system, and I think you know, that's something a lot of people are going to appreciate. So um, this has all of the modern touches that I think many people were looking for from the previous generations, but just it wasn't there. Now it is. Um, so this isn't just an incremental update. Again, uh, there was nothing wrong with that 60 megapixel sensor, so Sony left it as is. Um, if you're shooting in their Super 35 mode when it comes to video, that seems like it's, again, that's 4K, but that seems like the way to go because you will get an oversampled uh, 6K uh, image from that, something that unfortunately doesn't happen in the 8K or traditional 4K, um, the, the full sensor mode. Uh, but, you know, I've got to play with it more, see how it works. Um, from a, a stabilization standpoint, I wish we had the dynamic stabilization that was just revealed with the ZV-E1. We do not. But remember, this is a still camera first, video uh, second. It does feel, though, like more of a hybrid, that hybrid than days past uh, between the display and the AI unit from a video uh, perspective as well when it comes to autofocus really should be a major advantage. That's one of the big features, obviously, with the new ZV-E1. So this really started the entire uh, AI you know, push for Sony, essentially taking the A7R4 and making it smart, or I should say smarter, right? Uh, because now it has the ability to try to decipher what it should be focusing on uh, before it simply wasn't that intelligent. Also, a lot of new autofocus modes have been added to this in terms of detection, insect autofocus, just so many things, planes, trains, automobiles. This, it really has gone to another level, and that's the beauty of bringing AI into the mix with this. So I will be testing this out. Battery life, for those of you wondering, I expect to be, you know, 500 some odd shots because we're working with the same FZ uh, battery. Nothing changed there. Um, but again, modern improvements to really make this camera smarter than it has been in years past. Something I think that all of Sony's bodies are sorely missing. The whole industry is sorely missing it. I'm hoping this is the beginning of a trend towards smarter bodies. Just to give you a quick comparison side by side with the only A7R that I still have, which is the aged A7R2, which still from a sensor standpoint is excellent. Um, but of course, five 
uh, frames per second continuous shooting. And well, I'm not even going to get into all of the technical differences, but you immediately see um, this body is considerably launch, uh, larger than the new A7R5, really building off of the A7 IV, um, and then just trying to pull attributes from every advancement Sony has made and just wrap it all up with a bow, which I think they've done a nice job of. Again, 3900 is a uh, expensive price for this piece of kit, but remember, I'm saying I likely wouldn't be interested in getting it because I have the A1. The A1 is a $6,500 body. Um, another thing I will say, if you're coming from the A7R4, you're probably not going to want to run out and get this just because of the EVF, all of these improvements, the AI and the display. But then again, uh, between the menu system and those elements, improved Wi-Fi, all that stuff, you may want to run out and get it. I'm not going to dismiss it. Also, we finally have the ability, um, you know, when it comes to compressed RAW, that's another element I'll get into another time. So really, they've addressed so many things to polish and finish uh, the A7R line with this specific body. While it may look and smell a lot like the R4, it has a lot going for it. But that said, if you have the R4, you probably aren't going to run out and grab this as an upgrade. Then again, if you're coming from something like the R2 that I just showed over there or the R3, this does appear to be a phenomenal upgrade from those cameras, especially if any of these features appeal to you, which I think they're going to for a lot of you. But keep your eyes peeled for the full review comparison, possibly to the A1, although I think that's slightly unfair, but I think some of you are going to think it's very fair. And of course, I'll have remarks uh, regarding what I personally perceive to be the big differences between this new body and its predecessor, the A7R4, which is still an excellent camera at a much better price um, now that this body is out there. And I think a lot of you are going to say that's the best feature is that the A7R4 became a little bit more affordable. Still retailing for 3200 though. So that's another discussion. 39 versus 32. Um, if you're starting fresh, any questions or comments, please feel free to post them at that like button. And as usual, please feel free to subscribe and please stay safe. Later.